Uh, we're so grateful to Dr. Thomas DeMaria, who joins us today from the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement. He will share information and tips from his expertise on grief, grief awareness, and self-care practices that education support professionals can use to cope uh, during the global public health crisis we are in and beyond. The National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles is dedicated to supporting students through crisis and loss. Since 1990, center experts have assisted hundreds of schools and communities in the US and abroad to cope in the aftermath of tragedy, playing a vital role in helping to foster resilience after crisis events, including the COVID-19 pandemic, terrorist attacks of the World Trade Center, school and community shootings and stabbings, as well as natural disaster sites abroad. Dr. DeMaria is both a clinical and school psychologist and fellow in both the trauma and clinical divisions of the American Psychological Association. He has over 20 years experience in behavioral health leadership and is recognized for his accomplishments as a teacher and mentor. Dr. DeMaria was recognized by the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies for his clinical work with World Trade Center families and first responders, and he's a two-time recipient of the New York State Liberty Award for community service following disasters. Tom, would you like to get started? Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And okay. Um, it's an honor to be presenting uh, to you guys out there, and uh, thank you so much for being with me during this journey. Uh, there's going to be two parts to the journey. Uh, the first part will be talking about grief, and uh, the second part will be talking about self-care. Both go hand in hand, but we're going to first go into the, the world of grief to talk a little bit about what many people uh, are experiencing. I was quite touched to read the responses. There was a survey given out before this presentation was made about how many people out there have lost people and uh, or also suffered other loss because of the pandemic. And we're going to talk about that first uh, so we can get grounded in the fact that you guys have been through a tremendous journey and have shown a lot of resilience and courage, but you're still bearing the pain of those losses. So I think we need to both honor your sacrifices, your losses, but also give you some tools about how to keep moving on and being resilient. Uh, so thank you. And again, it's an honor. The pandemic it was quite an unusual, it is quite an unusual thing for us. And sometimes I step back and, and I think it, it's something from a science fiction movie that we never would have guessed before. And we've gone through a long and many months of it. So I think it's, it's good to pause and seeing all the stress that we had to you know, kind of deal with. All that hand washing and sanitizing, uh, the protective gear when you leave home, uh, the medical tests for viruses or antibodies, the learning from home and teaching from home, or if you have children, making sure they're st sticking to the computer, uh, the neck and eye strain from looking at the computer so often, uh, the sleep, eating, and family routines that are all diff changed, uh, the differences in exercise uh, problems, because for a while we couldn't get into health clubs and go to recreational sites, this physical distancing and isolation, the opening of only essential businesses and food and supply shortages, and from a lot of people say, being together with our family members all the time. Again, quite a unique time and quite a, a challenge for us, but we've gotten through it so far, and I think it's built a strong sense of resilience, but it's good to honor and really acknowledge all the things we've been through. We've also been through... We've also been through a lot of worrying. Uh, I think a lot of people, it was the majority response, talked about the worries as the major consequence of the pandemic. Will I or my family members get sick? We've been worried about that for such a long time. Will a vaccine or cure be found? Will society ever return to normal? Will the economy recover? What about the future of my retirement funds and plans? Will our children's future be harmed? Will I be able to transition back from working at home? Many people are already doing that. How will my work performance be judged given this situation? So the stressors and the worry have been a burden we've been carrying. And I, I think it's good to acknowledge how strong we are to have gotten through that. And not that people haven't suffered and a lot of people have suffered from a lot of emotional pain, but it's still a real powerful statement about what we've been through and, and how strong we are. But I want to talk about, and this is really going to walk into that uh, place of grief and loss, 
there's been a lot of losses during the trans pandemic. A lot of people have suffered in a lot of different ways and are still grieving. I think the most common thing that people feel during this time is that sense of emptiness and, and that sense of missing things. Um, in terms of what losses, well, a lot of people sadly uh, have reported the death of a family, coworker, or neighbor, or a person they know and care about. Uh, about 40% of the people who responded reporting having that loss, and my condolences and sadness out to you about that. Some though have also, and many of us have had that financial insecurity and our quality of life, you don't get those months back, and that's a loss. A lot of us have uh, suffered because we've lost those experience and activities, the time with friends, uh, the time for learning, vacation, travel, participation in sports, theater, restaurants, concerts, religious services, and those we can get back, but sadly, the events and milestones in our lives, the graduations, the birthdays, the anniversaries, those losses too. Obviously, the death of a, a loved one or a person we work with or a neighbor is, is more important than anything, but those other losses are there too. And I think we need to just take a step back and realize we've been grieving. Uh, whether we are aware or not, we're grieving for that time that we lost and that time in their lives that is not here anymore. Now, for those of you in, uh, out there who've had people that have died during the pandemic, it, it was quite a hard time for you. Uh, talking to people about people who've lost people, uh, I, it's, it was just so unusual and so, so difficult. There was the abrupt separation and goodbyes, uh, the unable to visit or communicate with your loved ones or the people you work with when they're in the hospital. You couldn't get health information. You couldn't find anything about what was going on. You, you couldn't help. It seemed random. You were also fearing at the time for your personal safety. And some of you were involved in making health decisions for loved ones at a distance. And the sadness that maybe your loved one or the person you cared about died alone. So you're feeling helpless and powerless. And that's all part of that grief experience that makes it so, so complicated. And then what made it even more difficult is sometimes mourning and uh, grief had to be postponed because you were busy taking care of yourself and your family. And your support network normally would come over to your house or be there to give you a hug. I wasn't around, couldn't do that because of their own safety issues. And sadly, funerals, cultural and religious healing ceremonies uh, couldn't happen because of the restrictions during COVID. So the, the backup of grief for the death of a loved one um, with all the other losses really makes this topic, I think, really important right now. And um, I'm glad that we have this opportunity to share this time together so I can kind of walk you through some of the things we know that might help you through this painful period. To start off, though, about grief and mourning, uh, again, doing this work as a psychologist for well over 30 years, there are things that I hear people keep talking about that are meant to be comforting, but sometimes they work the opposite way. One of which is there are stages in the grief process. People talk about the stages of grief as if you're supposed to walk through one stage and suddenly you change to another stage. And in my working with uh, grieving people, you go through all of them at once sometimes. And sometimes you go through one and you go back to another. So there's no progression of stages. Um, it's something a lot of people may go through, but most people don't. Most people have a lot of feelings. So people shouldn't feel guilty if they're not going through the acceptance and they're not in the denial or anger stage or whatever. It, it's different. The other myth is that guilt is felt the same way by everyone. No, it's different. It depends on you. It depends on your belief systems. It depends on culture you're from. It depends on how your family handled grief. So it's all going to be very, very different. And, and I think it's important to respect that, that you're going to be feeling things that sometimes people won't share. It doesn't make them bad. It doesn't make you bad. It just means it's different. Another myth is that you'll feel grief all the time. Well, no, uh, grief is a normal emotion. It's something that happens when we lose things we value and people we love. And it will come in and it will come out like waves on a beach, but it shouldn't be with you all the time. If it is, it's something else. And we'll talk more about that, but it shouldn't be there all the time. The other myth is that there is a normal time period or length for grieving. Um, if we believe TV, movies, and, and, and shows, it seems to happen in the next episode. They're through that, that, that death of a person, but that's not necessarily true. Some people say six months, some people say years, some people say five years. And I found from 
than being with people who've gone through grief that you don't really let go of grief. You just learn to carry it differently. It's something, it's a burden you carry that you'll always have because you love the person. It's just your relationship with them has changed because they're no longer here, but they'll always be with you. So there's no time period or length for grieving. I've gotten a lot of calls, believe it or not, because somebody will call worried about a family member that they're not crying. And one of the myths is if you don't cry, there is something bad. Not necessarily. You may not be a person who likes to cry. And it doesn't mean you didn't love the person or care about them. Again, your grief is felt in a special way that's just for you. I guess the opposite end of that, and it's another myth about grief and mourning, is that too much emotional expression is a bad sign, that if you yell and scream, that's a sign that's something going wrong. Well, no, it's just your way, and it's, um, it's just a way that you have that might be different than other people. I guess to put it all together, and it's really an important uh, point of this whole talk, is how do you grieve um, uh, you know, in a way that's personal to you, that's meaningful to you, it's natural, and not let yourself be dissuaded or, or convinced that you have to grieve in a set way or, or a certain thing. And the other important point is, is how do you grieve over the noise of life and over the noise of this pandemic? How do you, how do you let the grief feelings happen and let the grief flow through you? Uh, because it's important and it's an important transitional process. And that's what we're going to try to talk with and give you some suggestions for. Now, um, in the grief world and grief research, we talk about uncomplicated, we hate to use the word normal because there's no normal, everybody has it differently, but there's uncomplicated grief. And then there's complicated grief, grief that takes a little bit more help sometimes, sometimes from a professional, uh, mental health person or a, a, your minister, priest, rabbi, imam. Um, there's different types of grief. Um, so we're going to talk most about the uncomplicated, the normal grief that we all feel at different points in time. And then we're going to talk about the complicated grief and certainly the pandemic. And that's my concern for people out there. It's made you're allowing grief to happen above the noise of the pandemic much more difficult. So what is, uh, what, what do we know about grief? Well, if you're feeling grief, and for those of you who are feeling grief who had, it's an intense, painful emotion which comes and goes. It knocks you over sometimes and it can make you really feel tense, horrible feelings, but then it goes away. And then you're able to go about your day and those feelings kind of drift in and out. When you're grieving, you also feel guilt about being happy, having positive feelings and experiences, and that's perfectly natural. Obviously, you think about the person who died and you will think about them a lot. And it's common for people not to believe they're not with us. It, it, although you know they're dead, it's kind of hard to believe that they are. And, and, and in your mind, I, it's kind of a strange process that both you know and, they, and you don't know that they're not there. And part of it also is difficulty imagining a future without the deceased. It's hard to imagine the, the next day without that person with you and that person enjoying life and experiences. And, and that leads you to want that person back. And, want to have that, those moments with, with that person. During the process of grief, your concentration is not going to be so good. You could be a little bit more distracted and you'll make more mistakes. So make sure you check what you're doing a couple of times and forgive yourself for that. You may lack interest in other people and activities and just kind of feel a little you know, listless, numb, just want to kind of go through life a little bit. You might have dreams of the person who died and you might look for them in crowds. Some people would report seeing them at a distance or seeing somebody who looks like the person. And some people would report sensing their presence in their life still and feeling a sense of protection from them. And obviously your sleeping and eating is not gonna be so good during this part, especially the initial part of grief. So that's considered to be normal grief. And, and these are perfectly natural. It doesn't mean that you know, it's not something that's uh, we all experience in one way or another and to different degrees. You're not going to have all of these symptoms or signs. You may have some of them, but those are typically what people experience and we'll talk about in terms of going through their grief. When you're grieving, you also get triggered. Uh, things kind of jump up at you and remind you of the grief. And sometimes the direct reminders of the person who died, they're their favorite song comes on the radio or it's uh, a favorite movie they liked or 
It could be something they would say someone else says, and it just brings you there. What also can trigger a grief for you is when other people die. When you hear about other people dying, it oftentimes brings you back to the loss of your loved one. Uh, grief could also be triggered by activities you enjoyed in the past with the person who died, like riding, taking walks, watching sports, uh, all will remind you of that person and they can be triggers for your grief response. What's pretty common is significant events or milestones like anniversaries, holidays, birthdays, kind of remind you of that person. Uh, they talk about it being the first, you know, the first uh, holiday after the person died that you shared together. You remember them more, there'll be more grief triggers and that grief will come up more. And grief will also be triggered and come up a little bit more at times of a lot of stress. So when you're really a lot of stress, sometimes that grief will come about a little bit more and happen a little bit. So how do you cope with the grief, this uncomplicated, normal or acute grief? How do you handle it? Well, first part of it is to understand and accept grief as a normal emotion that's part of the, what we feel. And, when you're grieving, you'll feel a wide range of emotions, including anger, sadness, anxiety, loneliness, and sometimes exhaustion. And remind yourself that grief is a result of our love and attachment uh, to the person. It's our connection. We'll talk about that in a little while, but accept that that's what grief is really. Uh, but we'll feel a lot of emotions. But a lot of times that's just the way the grief is coming out. Manage that emotional pain. Let the grief come and go naturally. It's like waves that come in and roll out. It's like a roller coaster that comes in and come out. Identify those feelings as grief and allow them to happen. If you don't fight them and just allow them to happen, they tend to roll right back out. If they get stuck, well, then that's more complicated grief. And, and that could be depression too. But right for most times, grief will just happen and roll out of you and allow you to self to have positive feelings and activities in your life. You can be grieving and still laugh. You can be grieving and still do things that are positive and enjoyable for yourself. You don't need to punish yourself or be miserable to show that you're grieving for somebody. You can still laugh and grieve for the person too. Uh, that's fine. Try to find meaning in the person that, that died and, and the experience and accept the possibility of new experience and happiness in the future. And ask yourself, what did you learn from the death about what is important, which can provide new meaning, direction, and purpose in your life? How can the, the death of this beloved person, the person you work with, inspire you to make your life better, enjoy your life more, find new meaning, help you grow? What meaning can you find in this experience? And you shouldn't rush that. That may just take a lot of time to kind of find meaning out of the pain that you've experienced. But it is something that can help you find some purpose in all the suffering and also the death of someone you cared about. Don't move away from others. Strengthen your relationship with others. Accept support. Let them know that you may not be very talkative and you may not want to hang out with them, but if you want to watch a movie with them and if you want to just accept their food that they might bring over the house, that's okay. It doesn't mean that you're not grieving it, but it helps, I think, the grief not be so painful. Try sharing stories, photographs, videos, and memories of this deceased with those friends. Let them know about your connection and, and who that person was. Lower your expectation for others to really fully understand where you are or what you've been through, especially if it's somebody that, you know, they might not understand the nature of your connection with them and may not understand that if it's not a family member, why you're feeling such intense grief. That, that's personal and that's, that's special to your relationship, but don't expect other people to understand it and don't necessarily be angry at them for that. You might need to stay creative, to stay connected during this time of social distancing. And it may be a little harder to honor the deceased person with special ceremonies and memorials, but maybe think about doing that on, online or through Facebook or any other social media that you may be comfortable with. There are other ways. Uh, and during this pandemic, we have to stay creative that way. I think you also, and this gets back to what we talked about at the beginning, uh, is that you need to talk about issues that may complicate grief, uh, especially about the way the person may have died and the feelings that you may have that were upsetting. 
but it's good to talk about those issues with somebody. If need be, obviously you can seek out a mental health professional or somebody that you feel close to, but share your story with others. Some people benefit from also writing about their story because that helped those feelings get out. But in talking to a lot of people who are grieving during the pandemic, I tell them they gotta be careful that there's these thought traps. These are feelings which keep you stuck. They keep you stuck in the pain of the loss and, and don't help you move through the grief. And these thought traps are tricky because sometimes they can, they can keep you rolling around in them. For example, these are just common thought traps. She or he did not have to die this way. I am to blame. Someone is to blame. I feel guilty to be alive while she or he is dead. I am embarrassed to be feeling this way. I have to think about her, him all the time. My life is over without her and him. I wish I did not say that to her or him. You think about that conversation or the things you said, but again, life's about a lot of things we say. Most people, things we say to people, we intend, but sometimes afterwards be like, maybe um, I didn't want to have said that. I wish I could do that over again. And when people don't die, you have that chance, but when people die, you don't. But to punish yourself for that, that's a thought trap. Again, a lot of these thought traps are a way that we try to get control of something rather than just moving past it so we can acknowledge and transition a relationship with the person who died and be careful not to get stuck in these thought traps. Learn to live with grief triggers, you know, embrace grief triggers rather than avoiding them. So when you get triggered by something to remember the person who died, think of a happy memory. Think of something that will inspire you with those grief triggers and discover meaningful and comforting memories when the grief is triggered. Um, the times you laugh, the times you had closeness with the person who died can help you rather than being angry or shocked by those grief triggers, help you find some comfort in, in their passing. Importantly, I probably the most importantly is you have a continuing bond. Uh, death does not separate us from people. It, it doesn't change that bond. It changes the nature of the relationship with the person. They're not here with us, but if you care about somebody and they're with you, they'll always be with us inside. They're, they're always in our thoughts and our hearts and they're always there. Understand that memories are a living part of the connection to the deceased. They'll live on through our memories. They'll live on through that connection, that continuing bond we have with them. And one way people continue to sh demonstrate that bond is to remember and honor them. They donate to charities. They do things to maintain their legacy somehow. And that's important, but memories are also part of that legacy. Some people like to maintain their connection by visiting their gravesite or keeping symbolic objects which remind them of the deceased, an article of clothes, a, a, a gift that they had given the person and now they have in their possession. But that's not for everybody and it is for some people. People often ask me, Can I, do I have to go to the grave all the time if I'm grieving? And I said, no, if that's not what you need to do for your grief, that works for you, then you don't have to go to the grave. Some people, it, it is important. So again, try to rep represent and respect the unique cultures and um, uh, faiths and backgrounds and wishes of people to grieve in their own way, as long as it's not hurting them or not helping them in some way. And if it's helping them sort out the grief, that's what's most important. Now I wanna to touch on complicated grief and it's something I ask you to take a look at um, because grief comes and goes, as I mentioned, and it, it gets a little bit easy to carry over time, but sometimes it gets complicated. And these are some of the warning signs that you should take a look at to see if this is where your grief is. If there's a persistence of intense grief, which you believe will never end. If you're always thinking about the deceased, it's intrusive, it's always in your mind. You can't get it out of your head that he died or she died. Again, that's a sign that there might be something that's complicating it. Guilt and feelings of betrayal about planning for the future or enjoying life after the person died. Difficulty accepting the deceased will not return. You can't accept it. This is not the first couple of days. This is as the grief goes on for months. Avoidance of reminders that the person is dead or being over-involved in activities connected to the deceased. You try to either avoid 
the reality that they're dead, or you just want to live the life as if they're still alive. Again, not healthy for you. If you start to believe your life is now meaningless and over, and there's nothing to look forward to, if your life is full of anger and bitterness, if you believe that grief is all you have left with your connection to the deceased rather than the many wonderful memories you still have, if you have difficulty trusting and caring about other people, if you're detached, if you're starting to neglect your medical health or you start to overwork, those are warning signs that maybe the grief has got a complication there that has to be sorted out. Now, what makes grief kind of complicated at times is some things that have happened that we know, uh, certainly uh, the nature of how they died, if they died during the pandemic, could put you at risk. You have to be careful. But we've, we've seen, but looking at people who have complicated grief, often they have experiences with loss as a child, the death of a parent or someone very significant in their life and their background. They were dependent on the deceased. The, the person who died really was very, very important to them and took care of them and was somebody so essential to their life. Sometimes it's hard to let that physical connection go. If, if you've had many prior important losses, this is just another one that just piled on. It's sometimes hard to decide who to grieve for and what you're grieving for because there's so many issues to grieve for. If you've had a difficult or unfinished relationship issue with the deceased person before they died, if there's unfinished business, Sadly, some people reported that they had an argument that before the person got sick and they couldn't finish the argument or they, they couldn't work it out. Well, arguments are part of intimacy. and It's part of how we, we deal with people. You didn't know that they were going to die. You, didn't, you weren't intending to hurt them in a way, but somehow magically, if you, if you believe that that's, that's important, that's something that uh, something you should kind of think about a little bit. I'm sorry, that was the telephone. Uh, if you've had prior adverse events in your life, uh, if you've had, uh, in other words, if you had other bad things, traumatic events happen in your life, if you've had problems with anxiety and depression, sometimes grief could kick, kick them off a little bit. If you've had poor medical health, uh, your health um, has suffered a little bit, it might be harder to carry that burden of grief. If you don't have social supports and if you're under a lot of current stress, again, they make sometimes grief get more complicated. And again, it really, um, and my strong recommendation is if, if you're stuck, you need to help someone get you unstuck. And sometimes a person outside of you needs to help. And again, a mental health professional could be a good resource for you. Now, if you don't treat a complicated grief, research finds that you can get existing medical conditions worse. And there's actually, believe it or not, if you carry grief with you and it doesn't, you don't shake it and it stays with you, it puts you at increased risk for things like cancer, cardiac disease, hypertension. It causes sleep problems, problems in daily function, and you could develop serious emotional problems like depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance abuse, and suicidality or self-harm. So complicated grief is important to kind of recognize. It doesn't happen all the time with grief, but if you find you're drifting a little bit more into those things that I mentioned, it might be worthwhile to talk to somebody. So to put it all together, grief is a normal feeling. It's a normal reaction. We all go through it differently. And it doesn't go away. We just learn to carry it differently. And we all went through a lot uh, during the pandemic. We all went through a lot of losses and a lot of different levels. The most important and serious one is when we lose someone we care about, someone we work with, or a family member. And we have to give some time to let the grief kind of symptoms and, and what we go through kind of um, move on and, 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 and seek their own way. Um, and we have to realize that the person may be gone from us in this world, but they're always in our memories and that should provide some comfort. Again, that's the ultimate goal in grief. But uh, sometimes it gets complicated and we should be aware and get the support we need if that should happen. So our journey now, we'll, we'll move out of grief and really talk about what I've seen, and I've worked with uh, healthcare professionals, I've worked with a lot of schools, I've worked with uh, people in the community, I've even worked with people in businesses, and I've been listening to what have they done, you know, to kind of help themselves um, cope with all the stress that we're all going through and still go through. Uh, it's, it's a definite turbulent time. So these are some of the strategies that I picked up and put together for you, and we'll talk about this 
And if uh, you have questions, certainly you can put them in the question and answer box and I'll try to answer them uh, later in the presentation, but please write those in. Uh, the first uh, step in terms of self-care and good stress management is we have to figure out the best way uh, we manage our information in our lives. We live in an information age. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ways we get information. We can watch the news, we can go online, we can go to social media, we can uh, um, engage in other forms of getting information, even reading newspapers, which is kind of old school, but it's still there for a lot of us. But how much information do you need? And what's the best amount for you to feel safe? You have to figure out how to control your media diet. And the problem is if you don't control your media diet, you lose perspective and you don't digest the news. All the news does is support fears and anxieties that we may have. If you scan uh, your, your television and you, find, you want to get scared, you'll find a show that can get you scared. But is that the best way to digest all this news? Um, and it's really hard because uh, people ask me advice and guidance and it seems to change every day. And I go to the CDC's website or, or other credible websites, you know, and I, and I look for information, the American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, about what are they saying? What, what's the current strategy? But the, the difficulty is, is if you don't um, control how much news, one bit of news that doesn't fit what we do know can throw us off. So figure out what's the best amount of news uh, that you can take in daily to feel safe. I try to limit to myself to 10 minutes of news in the morning and about 10 minutes of news at night. And that's my news diet. I realize if I have too much news, all I do is I start to feed anxieties that I don't need to have. So, but I do need to be informed. And uh, I guess you need to sort that out a little bit. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about later that one way uh, to keep your media diet in a good place is to not talk about the news when you're with your friends, talk about enjoyable things. And, and we'll get to that soon too. Uh, limit your worry time. Uh, being fearful all the time is draining. It can become a full-time job, which taxes your resources. And remind yourself that most of what you worry about will not happen. Uh, about 90% of anxiety is anticipation about things that don't happen. We tend to predict the rainy days all the time, and oftentimes it's sunny. Uh, I find that with the weathermen sometimes. But I also find that in my life, too, that sometimes I predict what's going to happen tomorrow that's going to be so tough. And you get through tomorrow, it's and eh, that wasn't so bad. And you might want to have worry-free times during your day where you allow yourself to have an hour or a half hour where you're not going to worry about anything. You're not going to let anybody make you worry. You're just going to have a worry-free time. And that's good because it helps the body replenish. Know the difference between what could happen and the risk of something happening. We talk about it because you can think about being possible it does not necessarily mean it's going to happen. You know, we're all terrified of thinking about shark attacks, but given all the people in the world, there's a pretty low risk of you getting eaten by a shark. I wouldn't want to be in the ocean full of sharks, but as one lifeguard told me, the ocean is full of sharks. They're always around, but there's very little chance that we're going to get bitten by a shark. But again, we sometimes inflate it and we think about the most catastrophic and most horrible thing because those are easy to think about, but we scare ourselves sometimes. So realize because we can think about it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. Or because we're told that something horrible can happen doesn't necessarily mean it will happen. So kind of control how much your imagination takes go over and don't think of the awful catastrophic outcomes all the time. Try to think of what's probable. And again, we get fooled sometimes when I go buy my lottery ticket, I think I'm going to win. I don't think I'm not going to win. But again, I'm not thinking of probability, I'm just thinking of possibility. The possibility that I could be a millionaire is there, but the probability is I'm not. But I don't want to think about it when I buy my lottery ticket. But when you hear about something that scares you, think about the same thing. Because you can think about it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. Manage expectations. Everybody's got expectations. There's what your boss has for you, there's what the children, there's what the parents, there's what the community, there's what your old family, there's what your friends are, and you can get pretty tired running around making everybody happy. So should you try to you know, work with people to kind of figure out how to both meet your needs and their needs? Yeah, but you can't make everybody happy. And if you try to make everybody happy, you're not going to be happy. I can guarantee it because you can't. And oftentimes people have things they want you to do that are different than what 
you want to do or what the other person wants to do. So try not to live by expectations. Try to live by what you think is fair and what you can accomplish. And that's really important in terms of setting realistic goals for yourself. Perfectionism is not the same thing as excellence. During the pandemic, it's been so unique. There's no clear guidelines and allow yourself to make some mistakes every so often and, and have flexible expectations and allow yourself to say, I'm not perfect, they're not perfect, and the world's not perfect. Try to not to let anger and, and at yourself or at the world or at other people cause you to, to not work with other people or not like yourself. Uh, again, it gets back to expectations, but try to let yourself make mistakes and learn from them rather than beating yourself up about them. Pace yourself. Remember the tortoise and the hare story? The tortoise, you know, uh, you know, always took slow and steady and the, the rabbit, the hare ran ahead and got tired and the, eventually the tortoise or the, the turtle won the race. And it's hard to maintain high levels of stress and productivity for long periods of time. You can't, you, you break down. And if you're so exhausted by being worried, it will wear you down too. So being careful and vigilant or watchful is very different from being terrified and, and fearful all the time. Take rest breaks. Take a chance to rejuvenate and recharge yourself. Uh, you don't do it because you, you want to, but you need to. You need to do that because if you keep pushing yourself, you're going to make more mistakes. You're going to start not liking your job. You're not going to like what you do. Take those breaks. I, you often have them booked into your schedule. Don't make phone calls. Don't do 100 different errands during those little break times. Take a breath, relax, close your eyes. Think of something relaxing. Take a nice walk to exercise. Use those brace, breaks in your, in your day to pace yourself. Feed your support system. Thank your family, friends, and fellow staff for being there for you. I, it's always amazing when I'm at a job and someone comes up to me and they say, thank you for helping support me. And I said, what do they do? Well, saying hello to you every morning is a good thing, but we forget to do that. We forget to thank the people we work with who help us because we're all connected to them. And another great strategy is if we want to make a change in your life, most changes don't happen. Uh, it's easy to start a diet. I'm, I'm sure everybody out there has either tried or or still dieting at this point in time, especially to lose those pandemic pounds. The problem is most diets fail. About 60 to 80% of diets that start fail, and you know you go through that. But the ones that exceed, there's a buddy. There's someone else to make you accountable, someone else to support you, someone else to be the cheerleader. Have that buddy around for you. That's really important. And share it together. Feed them and then let them feed you. It's a great way to kind of deal with stress and make sure you're taking care of yourself. Uh, remember, by the way, that physical distancing does not mean social isolation. However, you need to set boundaries and say no if the demands of others become overwhelming. A lot of people, you know, um, want people around, but forget that they have to say no every so often. And as I mentioned before, uh, share enjoyable topics when you're with friends. Don't just talk about the pandemic or the, or the news that's upsetting. Talk about enjoyable topics and fun plans during these check-in times. Try to have no news uh, talk, times to talk. Not that you should neglect the news and important topics, but it's fun to talk about things that we, you both enjoy and you share together. It, it, it's something that we forget to do, and it can be something that can be very helpful and, and very nourishing for us. Body. Remember this thing called a body that's, <laughs> that's attached to your mind? We forget, uh, especially when we're under stress, to be mindful about our body's need. And I can tell you, Exercise, sleep, and a healthy diet go a long way to helping you get energy back, a sense of control, and reducing your stress. And, and, it, and we know it, a lot of us struggle with sleep time sometimes because we bring all of our worries to sleep with us. We forget to put them under the pillow and get, get them the next day. So we have to figure a way to let go of that, especially at nighttime when sleep can be very difficult for a lot of people with a lot of stress. Try to include more relaxation and mindfulness activities with a little bit of distraction during the day. You, because we've, you've taken on so much stress with this pandemic, as we talked about at the start of the presentation, it's important to remember that you gotta do a little bit more relaxation every day. More so, you gotta intensify it much more because of all the additional stress that you've been feeling. And don't forget to throw a few couple of words of encouragement to yourself to lower your intention. We're really good at criticizing our, ourselves. I think the, the ratio of negative things we say to ourselves 
uh, discouraging things versus the encouraging things we say to ourselves is like a hundred to one every day. And track yourself one day. See how many negative things you say to yourself to motivate yourself versus the positive things. You'll be surprised. Don't forget to reward yourself and encourage yourself every so often. You'll find it goes a long way in maintaining your motiv motivation. So don't forget your body. These are some strategies that people have shared that have been helpful to them in terms of dealing with the stress. Obviously, meditation, relaxation, massage, yoga, exercise, crafts, writing on what you have achieved, learn something new, prayer and spiritual activities. Romance, it's still there. You can still find it. It can be a nice way to, to relax. Reading for no purpose. Have fun in the kitchen, uh, cooking new recipes. Change your home or apartment a little bit. Remove some of the clutter. Do a little gardening, or right now, gardening's gonna be a little hard, but do a little outdoor walking around and, and look at the beautiful change of season, depending on where you live. And sorting out all those personal and family photographs that have been there that you've not gotten to, now's a good time too, and it helps you reconnect to things that are important and happy times in the past. Optimism is a, is a good thing because optimists tend to have people like them more, tend to be healthier, tend to be more successful and live longer. So see the glass is half full and set a positive example and practice being optimistic and hopeful. When you go out with friends to a restaurant, if you can get to a restaurant these days, don't ask what you think of the meal, think of what did you like about the meal? If you're with your family watching a movie, don't say what do you think of the movie, what did you like about the movie? You can, you can really turn the, the mood and the tone of your family and your friends really quickly and model positivity and coping for your family, school staff, school community, students and loved ones. And you find it goes a long way to helping them see that and become that way too. We all know that one negative person can turn a crowd around, be positive you know, and, and help turn the crowd around to a positive way. We talked about laugh, laughing more. A sense of humor is a good way to get perspective. So watch comedy shows and have a respectful joke telling session. I find if you bring a joke every day to work and you tell it to one person, it's a nice way to kind of make their day a little bit happier and help you too. Laughter is a great way to reduce stress and engage in self-care. Reducing clutter in your life, get away things that you don't need. What are you saving them for? And part of that is grudges and guilt you maintain. What are you holding on to those grudges and what are, you, what are you maintaining it? Clutter could also be relationships that are one-sided or hurtful or to-do lists that are never attempted. Those honey-do lists that are on the refrigerator that never happen. Well, if they're up there and they, the paper starts to get brown and crinkled because they're up there so long, well, maybe it's time to take it down. And tasks that are more than you can handle, get rid of that clutter. All it does is it makes you feel you know, uh, stressed out in life and you feel that there's too much to deal with and it won't let you really enjoy your life. Forgive, it's a hard one, but build up your tolerance for yourself and other people. Remember, they're not perfect, you're not perfect, and the world is not perfect. Learn not to focus or look at the irritating behaviors of others because if you do, you'll find them, but try not to get pulled into that. Forgive the mistakes of others who may not be at their best at times and try to see things from their point of view. Use that empathy skill every so often and it work to let things go and forgive. Taking one day at a time is really important. Uh, don't look too far into the future. Handle what you can tackle today and savor, enjoy your accomplishments. Again, I can say it, we've been through a lot. Savor that, savor that you've gotten through, you've, you've fought through to get where you are today. And don't be a fortune teller and look in the crystal ball and look at the future. Stick with where you are today. Try to take what you did today, focus on your positive accomplishment, and build that confidence that you can handle things one day at a time. And what's important about that is you're resilient out there. I don't know if anybody told you, you've gotten through a really hard time. You've had to use your character strengths, your family, but whatever, you'll, you'll learn about resilience and courage by getting through bad times. And we've been through some really hard times right now. You've gotten through that. Acknowledge that about yourself. You're resilient. And use that confidence that you have to realize we're going to face future challenges. Whatever the challenges are, I've been through this. I can get through other challenges. And I think it's important to say that to ourselves because it can give us confidence to face some things that might be difficult in our future. And finally, my best wishes to everybody out there 
for letting me spend this time with you for peace and that resilience that you have in you. It's there uh, and acknowledge that for yourself. And thank you for this time. It's been, again, been an honor to talk with you. At this time, we will open up the floor for Q&A. We will address the questions in the order um, in which they've been received until we run out of time. As a reminder, only questions posted in the Q&A feature will be included in this portion of the webinar. Um, so if you've posted a question in the chat box, please restate your question uh, using the Q&A feature. Let's get started. We do have a number of questions. Um, the first one, Tom, is uh, from Kara. She says, I'm thinking this grief can be applied to the loss of normal life, not just in response to the death of a loved one. Is that, that correct? Fantastic insight. Yeah, um, uh, we're grieving right now for just the loss of our everyday life and what we didn't have and those opportunities. And if we recognize that, that little sadness that we feel about right now during the pandemic or that little irritability or crankiness might be due to the fact that we're grieving. So that's great insight. And some of the strategies we talked about, uh, and, I, and that's why I focus on resiliency and courage that people have had during the, this whole time is really important because we need to recognize that we've been strong and we got through it, but we are grieving. That's a great insight. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, the second question we have is, how do you approach a family member exhibiting several symptoms of complicated grief? It's really hard. And I, I tell you, I've been a psychologist uh, for a long period of time, and I've had friends who've, who've struggled with different mental illness issues or problems. It's really hard to tell somebody they have a problem, because usually what they tell you is not what you want to hear. And it's oftentimes not too happy that they're, they're being talked about that. But what I usually do is approach them and say, hi, uh, how have you been doing? I have some concerns about you. Uh, is there anything I can do to help? And I'm here if you ever need to talk about what you have, but, but I do have some concerns. And, and put that offer out there. Let them know that you're available to talk with them. You have some concerns. You care about them. But don't right away diagnose them or, or tell them, unless it's really serious, then obviously then you have to take the initiative. But Put the invitation out there. Let them know that you have concerns. You've been worried about them. You're here to listen to them, and you'd like to help them if possible. Offer that that hand out there. You know, I think it can really go a long way to let people know they're not alone, um, and that you're there to help them. Not just to direct them someplace, but you're you're there to help them through a difficult process. That's really helpful, Tom. Um, you know, our audience are education support professionals and teachers and specialized instructional uh, staff personnel. So, you know, so much of the work that's being done is really about that outstretching of hands and, and being responsive. So thank you for that. I learned, learned from being a school psychologist sometimes that it's sometimes approaching the child and say, hey, how you doing? You okay? Everything okay? Sure. Okay. I'll stop by tomorrow to say hello. It will take two or three days of that before the child will want to talk with you. You know, so sometimes you have to be persistent and gentle, and that's most important. That's right. Uh, we have a question uh, from Mari. How can we help someone else who is grieving? My grandmother died during the pandemic. I miss her, but my mother is really struggling and I feel guilty because I don't have the time to reach out to her very often. And I'm avoiding visiting because of the pandemic. It's a really uh, challenging situation right now. And again, I'm sad for your loss. Um, and oftentimes when someone's grieving, letting people know that you're there if they need you is important. Sometimes it's a message on the answer machine. Sometimes it's a note slipped under their door. Sometimes it's some food that's dropped off at the house with just a message, you know, that you're there for them. Knowing that you're there for them and if they need to talk, you can be there for them is more important because remember grief is a, a, a very unique experience. Yeah, it's an experience that there's no set rules. Some people like to be left alone. Some people like to have people around. But letting people know that you care about them, you're available for them and you'll be there for them is such an important thing when people are going through very difficult times. Obviously, if, if a loved one is going through more serious times, if you think they're depressed or it's getting more serious, you have to be more active. But, but most of the time when people are grieving and are not having complicated grief or depression or anything more serious, letting them know you're around and you care about them and just making that every so often contact to let them know that you care and you're there for them and anything they need, they can let you know. 
I'm talking to a lot of grieving people. Just letting them know that, that you're there is really important. Tom, we have a question from Deb uh, who asks, are, do you have any readings to recommend or media to watch? Um, what I can do is um, send uh, to uh, Kimberly or Jessica some uh, websites or other useful sources where you can get some good information. There's some good groups out there. Um, and a lot of you guys probably know them by now. So what I'll do is I'll get those resources and then we can get them out. Would that be okay? Uh, Kimberly? That would be wonderful. That'd be perfect. Um, thank you for that. We have another question um, from Corey. If educators are working in environments where grief and the language of grief is uncommon, what are some steps an educator can take to help the adults, their colleagues, begin to normalize grief so that the adults are prepared to support students? What a fantastic question. The uh, Coalition to Support Grieving Students, a group that uh, was founded by uh, the New York Life Foundation and the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement, has a whole curriculum on how to help schools and educators at all levels uh, and people working in schools uh, help learn the language of grief and actually become grief sensitive. Uh, if you go to the Coalition to Support Grieving Students website, there's free downloads, there's free videos, how to start the conversation, how to help uh, create a grief culture, a grief sensitive school. Uh, it's all there. So that's a great resource. And thank you for, for asking that. that. That should be very helpful. And thank you for trying to make your school grief sensitive. Um, that's wonderful. And, um, and I'll try to get a link included with all the other links that we're sharing with folks um, to that coalition. Um, I'm trying to see here, looking at the questions. It's uh, www.grievingstudents.org. That one I do remember. Thank you. Grievingstudents.org. You got it. Thank you. Um, let's see. How might educators be on the lookout for cultures that weaponize resilience as a way to bypass and recognize grief? In other words, they jump over. I, I guess I'm, I'm hearing that sometimes people will um, try to talk about resilience and not talk about the fact that people are grieving. Sometimes people try to look like they're not affected when they don't let, they don't do the work of grieving. And my concern about that is is that grief is something that's natural, but it occurs at its own pace. You can't race it and force it. So you can be resilient and be coping, but you, you're still going to be grieving. Grieving is something that you don't jump over and Grieving is something you can't force, or grieving is not something you can put aside. You don't like conquer grief or, or get past it. It's something that takes a while to process. Again, if you are grieving, in a sense, you, don't, you never really stop grieving. You just carry it differently. So saying somebody's resilient is usually talking about stress, and it's usually talking about coping, and it's talking about adversity. But grief is our connection. It's our continuing bond with loved ones. Why would we want to get past that? We want to just transition it from our love for the person here in the world to our love in the person in our hearts and minds. So you don't become resilient to grief. You learn to transition with grief. It's a whole different process. You, you're resilient with stress, uh, not necessarily with grief. Grief is our attachment and our continuing bond. That's true. Um, we have another question. Parents grieve when a child is diagnosed with a disability, loss of a perfect child. How is the best way to counsel these parents? It's, it's an important topic because oftentimes um, people don't fully understand what the, the nature and the severity of grief and parents who have a child with special needs or a child who's not gonna be what they expect to them, there's, a, there's grieving as the child grows through and sometimes goes through every developmental stage and that educating the, the family that uh, that disappointment and that grief is something that is natural uh, and it will pass uh, if they let it just pass. But if they become angry or if they try to deny it or try to uh, force their, their child to be what the child's not, it corrupts that whole experience. Uh, don't forget that we, we all go through loss and separation. It's, it's a normal process. We transition grades in schools. We leave jobs. We move to new neighborhoods. We have friends come and go. 
loss and grief are natural. So a parent who goes through disappointment at their, of their child, if the child doesn't meet their expectation, is gonna go through some grief, but they'll get past it if they allow those feelings to happen, acknowledge those feelings, but then adjust to the new normal, adjust to that uh, life and find the beauty in their child and the, and the things that they can love in their child while still grieving for their expectations and, and what they wanted to happen that didn't happen. That doesn't mean the child isn't a gift that they can still enjoy, but not denying the grief, uh, accepting the grief, letting the grief flow out of them and get past that, and then beginning that new relationship uh, with their child and based on more realistic expectations and, and, and embracing the child's unique special qualities. I really appreciated um, the way you responded to that question, and it made me think of um, the kinds of skills that educators need uh, to be able to respond in that way. Um, uh, everything that you were saying made me think of the word compassion, and I'm wondering if there are, um, if this coalition to support um, uh, grieving students, if there are skills that educators um, uh, uh, need to have in their back pocket, uh, if, that, if that resource has some of that information. Yes, it does. What we did uh, is we had all the major educational organizations look at the curriculum and content, and we, we, we asked, what can we do to raise that sensitivity awareness? And that's really the start of compassion. When you really try to get to know where someone is at. It's really the start of bonding with them and connecting with them and helping with them and understanding the experience of the grieving student, the grieving child in the classroom and what they go through and letting them know you can't exactly know where they're going through because you're an adult and they're the ch a child, although you may have had experiences yourself. Letting them know that you understand their experience and you respect their experiences go, go a long way to helping that child feel comfortable in a school. And that's really what we believe that everybody in a school uh, if you're a bus driver, if you're the front desk worker, if you're the yard monitor, if you're a security officer, if you're a teacher, a social worker, speech pathologist, you're all dealing with children who are grieving. And how do you let the child know that you, you have a safe space when you're with them, that if they need to grieve, they'll come and go during that moment, you're with them, it's okay. And you'll be okay with that. And that's important. So Kimberly, thank you for bringing it up. That website has lots of great information that you can use to help show that compassion and empathy for a child so they can know they're not alone in that, that, that feeling of loss. Thank you. Um, what are, are there any examples of intrusive thoughts that we should be aware of? I know sure. you read them, but. Yeah, like, it's funny, intrusive thoughts, it sounds like a fancy word, but it's thinking a thought that you don't want to think. Like, for example, you're watching a television show and all of a sudden, a thought about you know the person comes into your mind. It's usually not a pleasant thought. It's a thought that's a little disturbing about. I wonder what whether they were alone when they died, or I I, I wondered if you know they, they were calling my name, or I, I think I should have that what I said to them. I, I shouldn't have said that to. Them. It just comes right into your head. It just kind of knocks you over a little bit, and it can catch you you know when you're not expecting it. And those those type of thoughts are not happy thoughts. Those are kind of thoughts that throw you off a little bit. And oftentimes they'll, they'll make you sort of not be in the moment with whoever you're with and they make you not enjoy the moment with your family or friends. So those are what I mean by thoughts that, that kind of can jump in at you, especially if there's something about the death of the person that you love that's um, not uh, fully settled for yourself. You're not let that go a little bit and forgiving yourself for, for being human. Sometimes though, you're having a dinner and you're enjoying the dinner and all of a sudden a thought of how much you miss mom or dad or grandma or someone you care about and you just feel melancholy for a moment and you didn't plan to have that happen, but it just flows in. And sharing with your family, so I'm just having a moment thinking about grandma and the family might be quiet for a minute, but then I'm back. It was nice to think of grandma. Let's enjoy the rest of the meal. You know, so that's, that's, what I mean by intrusive thoughts. It's sort of thoughts that can pop in. Sometimes they're triggered by grief. A lot of times they just roll right in and that's what grief is. There's no rhyme or reason to how grief can roll in and roll out. But if you just gently have them, having a moment, I'm just thinking about mom or I'm thinking about dad, and then you let it go, you'll be able to then let grief 
come in and out of your life and not get stuck, you know, because you don't want it to get stuck in, in, in your life. You want it to flow in and out. And so you can enjoy that continuing bond you have with the person you lost. This next question is very much connected to the last one and, and also your response. I, um, the letting, the, the illustration of letting it in and letting it go is so helpful. Um, but I think there's something a little bit more in this question, which is, what are your suggestions for grieving for the death of a loved one while also trying to support your family members who are grieving for the same loss at the same time? And so I would think it's one thing to allow those thoughts in, just as you said, and to let them out as well. But I think there's something more in this question. Yeah, it is. Uh, and, and you know, as people working with children in whatever capacity you're in, and you might know a child's mother or father who died in the child's, in your school bus or in your classroom, or you see the child in the school, and you may feel grief because you had a connection to that person. But a lot of times we don't want to burden others with our grief and we want to give them the opportunity to grieve without necessarily having our grief intrude on their grief. When, and when really, and I've seen that by allowing yourself to have grief, allow uh, yourself having a tear and letting them know, I, I'm sad about your mom, I'm, you know, it helps them feel that it's okay to grieve. You're almost giving permission. And sometimes parents or, or people uh, who are caring for their children sometimes don't want to show that they're sad because they don't want to make their children feel sad or they don't want to uh, cause their children not to want to grieve. But I think as adults, we have a really great opportunity to teach social emotional learning by modeling how to have an emotion, share an emotion, and then let the emotion go away and get back to what you're doing. A teacher, for example, is teaching a class who just says to the class, yeah, I was just thinking about Johnny who's no longer here with us. And it made me feel sadness for a while, but then I remembered a good time we used to have with Johnny. Okay, okay, let's get back to the lesson. And see, showing the children that you can have an intense emotion, it doesn't mean you have to act out. It doesn't mean you have to do something to dissipate that emotion. And you can let it flow out of you and then go back to where you are. That's a great emotional lesson. And, and sometimes we hold it in because we want to be strong for others, but we don't model and show other people how we can handle those feelings in a good way, especially something as powerful and as important as grief. Thank you. Um, this next question is, uh, says currently grief also includes losing friends or family because of political differences and issues about the reality of the COVID pandemic. I feel that I've lost my family in another state as they are ignoring the guidelines and mask wearing. How does one deal with this kind of loss? Well, there's, um, there's loss of somebody in terms of, if I'm understanding the question, where someone actually dies and there's loss by loss of contact. Uh, it's called ambiguous loss when the person's there, but not there. Uh, they're available if you wanted to, but they're really not available. And sometimes, believe it or not, loss can be caused by mental illness, alcoholism or addictions. It could be due to incarceration. It could be due to problems with immigration. There could be a lot of ways loss is caused, but it's still loss uh, and you still will experience loss. It's ambiguous loss because the person's not really gone, they're just in jail, or the person's really not gone, they're you know, uh, lost to substance use, you know? but they're gone because they're not really there and emotionally connected to you. So you will still be able to grieve for that. It's different than if the person had died with as a physical ending, it's sometimes even harder. And I hear from people who have parents or grandparents suffering from Alzheimer's or another form of dementia that it's really hard because you're grieving, but they're still alive and it can be very confusing. So realize that it just doesn't have to be loss in terms of the death of someone. It could be loss in terms of separation and certainly the loss of not being able to see family because of the pandemic is a loss. You're experiencing it and the grief you can experience will be as intense uh, and Acknowledging that that is grief is very important. Thank you. Um, we are getting close to the end of our Q&A time. And so I've seen a, there are a number of questions that I kind of think we might be able to, to um, combine that are focused around grief and the children that um, the educators on this uh, webinar teach. Um, 
there's one question that's um, about students acting out. Is that a possible sign that they're grieving? Are there ways to um, specific ways to approach that with a student um, with the with that perspective? Sure, it's a great it's great insight because oftentimes children don't know what to do with feelings. We we don't get a course in school about how to grieve, you know, and uh, it was such a natural emotion. And, and oftentimes families don't teach the children too because they never really were taught or have a good understanding of what grief is all about. So sometimes, and we know for kids, when they can't put their feelings into words and their painful feelings, sometimes they begin to get oppositional or sometimes they put their feelings outside. They, they get more disruptive, they get more cranky. We know that for kids and adolescents, when they're depressed, they tend to be more irritable, cranky, oppositional, defiant. It's really just the depression being shown in another way. And grief is the same thing. When you're feeling that intense feeling and it needs to go someplace, you might get more disruptive behaviors, you may get more uh, children being disrespectful or children breaking rules, or even things, kids breaking things because that, those feelings are inside, they don't know what to do with them and they look for a way to get rid of them. And, and, and that can turn into these external behaviors or externalizing behaviors. Helping the children acknowledge that, um, that there's something behind all that, especially if it's a shared death uh, of someone they knew. This could be a member of the school community and. Sadly, a lot of schools have lost people you know, due to the pandemic. Um, it might be that, and it's worth taking another look to see for the children who are doing all that, maybe that's what's going on. Maybe there's a loss at home, or, or dad is not home for a while, or dad's not in the house, or there's divorce going on, certainly that's lost too. So I think that if you look below the surface and you begin to look at your children, the kids are getting into trouble a lot. Oftentimes there's a lot of loss that they're sharing. It could be, again, actual physical deaths, but it could also be the loss of a parent or, or the absence of, even you can say safety in the home, that they don't have that safety. That's a loss because of moving into a new neighborhood that's more dangerous, et cetera. So I think loss goes, can explain a lot of behaviors of children if we keep our ears open and, as Kimberly noted before, we have the compassion and we give them that compassion so we can listen to what they share to us. Thank you, Tom. Um, we're going to have one last question and then uh, there are a number of other questions in the Q&A and we will um, send answers to the remaining questions um, uh, via email. Um, so thank you everyone for engaging so much. This last question um, is really important, just given the fact that so many of these educators are in a virtual environment. What are your thoughts on virtual counseling at times when you're unable to observe body language or facial expression? And I also think related to that, there's another follow-up question around, is it important uh, to, um, maybe take steps, preemptive steps, to try to support students when you can't know, but you know things are going on? <laughs> so it's a lot of questions. <laughs> I'll try to in this. Uh, the first one is virtual anything is hard. And, uh, and uh, my, my admiration for you guys for managing it out there. Uh, I struggle with the Zoom uh, situation here, but I guess you learn a lot about people, not just by why they, what they look like and, and what they say, but their tone of voice, uh, their compassion, their statements, their listening. And you don't necessarily need to be in person to have that. Obviously, nonverbal communication is important, but just the tone of voice that you have and, and the capacity to listen. I think what I've learned from virtual learning, or, uh, virtual teaching is listening is such an important skill. And doing telemedicine, you know, I've been doing a lot of that via the phone or by different uh, internet platforms, I need to become a better listener and listen to tone of voice and even watch my voice and, and how I, t I speak to people because you can't make up for it by smiling or by gestures. So I think that what's really important is, is if you're doing that type of work, it's to make sure that you show that compassion and you show that availability and you, you can tell right away by, by, students pick it up right away by how you speak to them and the language you use. And the other part of it, I think, is, yeah, I think is you got to assume that everybody out there is grieving, that every child that you're dealing with is grieving about something. There's something that they've lost. There's something they've missed, whether it's graduation, a birthday party. It could be a relative or family member who's died. It could be the family's financial pressure. A lot of people not working. A lot of people are struggling. There's a lot of loss going on out there. And I think it'd be a fair topic if you wanted to include that in whatever way you can, just to 
normalize that process and help the children understand what that feeling is that they may not know about. It might not be that they're angry. It might be that they're really grieving. There's a loss that they're experiencing. Thank you, Tom. Uh, this um, presentation and just all of your expertise and perspective um, has been just such a comfort uh, to me listening to you and seeing all of the comments. So um, can't wait to share more of the resources that you mentioned tonight with everyone and also answer the rest of the questions um, remotely. And with that, uh, I just want to thank you and turn it over to Jessica. Thank you uh, once again, uh, Dr. Demaria. This will conclude our question and answer portion of tonight's webinar. And I would like to thank all of our participants for um, their full participation um, in tonight's session. As you know, this pandemic is having a devastating impact on our students, educators, and especially our communities of color. In times like these, we depend on the stability and support our public schools, public health systems, and public safety nets provide. These services form a network of support that help our communities grow and thrive and now face devastating cuts due to the economic downturn. Whether we are Black or white, Latino or Asian, Indigenous or immigrant, we must stand united to ensure our health, safety, and future success. That is why the NEA has launched a national campaign to demand that Congress respect the work educators do, that they keep our students, communities, and colleagues safe, that they support our families and remove barriers for our collective participation and voice, no exceptions. Congress can do this by immediately passing legislation to stabilize funding for public education in the upcoming school year, as well as addressing inequities impacting our students' opportunities and provide the necessary resources to protect our students and educators as they re-enter our nation's public schools. This moment calls on us to go all in for all of us. If you would like to be a part of this call to action, please visit www.nea.org slash COVID action to see how you can take action. To request a general session specific certificate of completion as a participant of recorded sessions, please send your request by email to espqweb at nea.org. All requests must include the session title and the on-screen certificate of completion code. Session certificates will not be approved if your viewer code is not included in the email request. Note, due to limitations in our ability to track attendance after live sessions, requests for personalized certificates will only be provided for participants of live webinars whose attendance can be verified. The certificate received for viewing recorded sessions will be session specific, but will not include personalized names. On behalf of the Center of Great Public Schools, NEA ESP Quality Department, I would once again like to thank Dr. Thomas DeMaria and the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement for tonight's engaging webinar presentation and thank you all for your participation. Stay safe, stay healthy. Good night from the NEA ESP Quality Department.